thank you all for coming on this uh, dry, as yet, <laughs> Sunday afternoon. And uh, as many of you know, we had originally scheduled this on President's Day weekend, which is a lovely weekend to schedule it if it wasn't for the fact that we had yet another one of our snowstorms. Uh, so it was great that Casey could be coming back with us. And of course, as you know, Casey is the author of Ike's Final Battle, The Road to Little Rock and the Challenge of Equality, which is published by World Ahead Publishing. It's a, the book is a culmination of five years of research and writing and draws on primary source material from the Eisenhower Library and elsewhere. Some, many of these are documents that I've never seen before. He shows Eisenhower's strengths and failures in coming to terms with the civil rights movement. This is the uh, first book on Eisenhower and civil rights in more than two decades and the first ever to reject the conventional wisdom and provide new insights into Eisenhower's important role in civil rights. Uh, Casey began his career uh, as a college intern in the office of former President Ronald Reagan. In 1996, uh, he began working on Kay Granger's first campaign for Congress, and after her election, he joined her Washington staff, where he eventually served as the Senior Legislative Assistant and Director of Communications. In 1999, he joined the Bush for President campaign as a speechwriter, and after the election, he returned to Washington to serve in the White House. He continued to write speeches, uh, but also uh, research policy, and in 2004, he was the chief author of the National Republican Party pa platform. After the 2004 elections, Pipes uh, came back home to Texas and opened a corporate communications consulting firm. To, during the 2006 election cycles, he served as the chief speechwriter to California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. And during his career, he has also written speeches for Mayor Rudy Giuliani, Senator Bob Dole, and uh, uh, Commerce Secretary Don Evans. He also serves as an officer in the United States Naval Reserve. He was commissioned by Navy Secretary Gordon England in the Pentagon in July of 2002, and he currently serves in the Navy Public, Re uh, Public Affairs Unit. He lives in Texas with his wife Lacey and their son Lincoln. Uh, and before I ask you to give him a warm eye of welcome, I want you to know also he's a friend of Richard Norton Smith. So if you have no questions about Eisenhower, feel free to ask questions about Richard Norton Smith. <laughs> Please welcome Casey Pipes to the proposal. Well, thank you all very much. Thanks, Tim, for that introduction. Uh, it is great to be here. And I do have Richard Norton Smith stories, although I'll have to edit all the good ones. So, um, uh, I'm delighted to be here in Iowa, and in particular to be here at the Herbert Hoover Library. Uh, Tim and I were talking earlier about the uh, relationship between uh, the 31st and the 34th president. Um, on his election night in 1952, one of the very first phone calls that uh, President-elect Eisenhower made was to the Waldorf, uh, to former President Hoover. Uh, and he greatly admired uh, Herbert Hoover and uh, in many ways sought, uh, sought his approval as president. Uh, I have to note with some irony that uh, Eisenhower himself probably uh, would have had very ambivalent feelings about somebody like me uh, writing a book about him. Uh, he didn't think much of speechwriters. He once said to one of his very best speechwriters, Art Larson, that if words were important in presidential leadership, then the American people should elect him anyway. Um, so I, I suspect he would have a very limited view of, of this project and what I tried to do. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I found him to be a fascinating subject, and this particular piece of the Eisenhower story, uh, a particularly uh, fascinating story. Uh, I was asked many times during the years that I spent researching and writing this book, why are you doing Eisenhower? I can't tell you how many times people ask me that. And the simple answer is because Eisenhower deserves to be remembered. Uh, Eisenhower deserves to be studied. He deserves to be revered, and frankly, uh, it's to our benefit to learn something from him because I believe Eisenhower in many ways still speaks to us today and still speaks to us on difficult uh, political issues that don't have obvious answers. Uh, the story that I chose to tell in this book is the story of Eisenhower's lifelong journey with race and civil rights and it was quite a journey but I think there are many lessons that we can all learn uh, from his progression on this issue throughout his lifetime. Uh, Fifty years ago in September of 1957 America faced the gravest constitutional crisis since the Civil War. When Arkansas Governor Orville Faubus sent out the Arkansas National Guard troops to block the court-ordered integration of Central High School, it was an open defiance of the federal government, the likes we had not seen since the Civil War. And it was not at all clear 
uh, in September of 1957, how this great crisis would be resolved. The eyes of the nation, indeed the eyes of the world, through television, uh, showcased this drama in living rooms all around the world, all around the country. And no one was sure in September of 1957 how it would turn out. That's the story I originally was attracted to, Eisenhower and Little Rock. But something happened to me as I began to research this story. I actually sort of changed my mind a little bit about what I wanted to tell in this book. What began for me as a case study of Little Rock transformed into a character study of Eisenhower. What started as a foray into policy making reemerged as a profile in soul searching. I became fascinated not so much by what Eisenhower said about civil rights, but what civil rights said about Eisenhower, and what it revealed about his heart and his mind and his character, and frankly, about his decision making process, about his leadership, how he dealt with tremendously challenging issues and yet found a way to resolve them in the end. This is the story. Ike's final battle of how the greatest American hero of his time was forced to <coughs> grapple with the greatest American dilemma of all time. This is the story of Dwight Eisenhower dealing with civil rights in America, an issue so problematic and so challenging that the Founding Fathers had wrestled with it, Lincoln had wrestled with it, TR, FDR, all of the great Americans before Eisenhower had wrestled without coming up with a solution to this issue, and in the 1950s, it falls to Dwight Eisenhower to try his hand at this issue. So the story that I wrote is not really a political history, it's a personal history. It's a story of how Eisenhower thought, what he was trying to achieve, how he tried to do it, what was important to him, and frankly, it covers the good, bad, and the ugly of, of Eisenhower on this issue. It covers him all the way from his early days in the Army, through the presidency, and even into his post-presidency years in Gettysburg. And it shows him evolving constantly on this issue and moving in a very positive direction. That he struggled in dealing with this issue makes his final victory all the more meaningful and all the more instructive to us as we look at our own times and the own challenges that we face. So what I want to do today for just a few moments is describe for you this book that I wrote. It is, as Tim said, based largely on primary source material, including some material never before seen. It was, when it came out in February of 2007, the first book on Eisenhower and civil rights in 25 years, as Tim said, and the very first one ever to rethink the conventional wisdom that he didn't care about civil rights. I found that not to be the case at all. I, th I found that he cared about it a great deal, but struggled with how best to go about it, as I'll explain in just a moment. And so what I want to do is, rather than just recount for you every step of the book and every step of his journey, I want to propose three questions that we focus on tonight. First, what was it Eisenhower believed about race and civil rights in America? Second, how did he approach the issue, particularly as president, although I deal quite a bit with his army years as well, because I think his army years directly influenced how he conducted his presidency. And finally, and, and most interesting to, to those of us who are history fans, and that's all of us here tonight, why has he never gotten any credit for this? So let's start with the first of these questions, which is, what did he believe about the nature of man and the equality of all Americans? As President Eisenhower was fond of saying that he found segregation to be criminally stupid, but he hadn't always felt that way. In fact, he had come quite a long ways by the time he entered the White House in 1953. Early in his career, when he emerges from West Point, as a freshly minted second lieutenant. He is stationed at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas, and he encounters troops of color for the very first time. He's asked to train a group of Illinois National Guardsmen, and he is very unimpressed. He takes them out to a shooting range, he puts them through some shooting exercises, they do very poorly, and he later says, quote, I took it for granted that black people were stupid. A couple of decades later, we find him again in the Philippines this time with General MacArthur again dealing with troops of color, again being unimpressed. He writes in his diary that he has learned to expect from the Filipinos, quote, a minimum of performance from a maximum of promise. In this, Eisenhower is very typical of his generation. He's very typical of Army officers of that era. But something happens to Eisenhower. In fact, something happens to the country, and it's World War II. World War II begins to change Eisenhower's whole thinking on the issue. 
And I note in the book several of these milestones uh, where Eisenhower comes across African American troops and is very impressed with what he sees. He hears about and admires the courage of the Tuskegee Airmen. He even insists on going uh, personally and congratulating them after a big dogfight over the Mediterranean. He hears about a black soldier who was condemned to death for uh, having an affair with a white British civilian. Uh, and he thinks that this is absurd, that he's going to be condemned to death, and he essentially lifts the verdict. He learns about press prohibitions on the coverage of uh, African American troops in the media. He thinks that's ridiculous, that they're serving as well. They deserve to be reported on. He lifts the, pr the press prohibitions. But the greatest change of all comes from the greatest battle of all, and that's the Battle of the Bulge. And here, after the Nazis successfully push back his line, Eisenhower is desperate for troops. And he has always been a great problem solver. He has always been a man who, in the midst of a crisis, can find a solution. And Eisenhower looks around for where he can find new troops that he can send to the front and do it in a hurry. And he realizes that there are tons of African American soldiers who are serving in, the, in the, essentially the service supply. Uh, they are driving trucks, they are working in kitchens, they are in the back of the lines, they are not at the front of the lines. That's by War Department policy, written by George Marshall. Eisenhower decides that it's time to rescind that. That here is a, a great group of, of ready manpower that he can take, he can train, and he can send them to the front. Now he does hedge a bit. Uh, some of his staff officers resist when he writes a first order offering them the chance to serve, quote, sold, uh, shoulder to shoulder with white soldiers. But he still, even when he tones down his order, still offers African Americans the chance to serve in combat at the front, in their own units next to white units. And thousands of them volunteer for this great chance. By the time their training is over, the bulge has ended, but they do serve in battles towards the end of the war, and they do very, very well. And Eisenhower takes notice, and Eisenhower is impressed. Years later, he singles out this moment as a turning point when he's talking to a young African American aide on the presidential campaign in 1952, and he says to his aide, Fred Morrow, the thing I will never forget is the sacrifice that those black soldiers made. It made an indelible impression on him. These men risked everything with limited training uh, and went to the front and did so very well against these highly trained, highly proficient uh, Nazi soldiers. So World War II changes him. He emerges from World War II thinking very differently about race than he did when he went into World War II. But it's also important to note that World War II changes the civil rights movement itself. Soldiers who went to the front of the line in battle weren't eager to go to the back of the bus in Birmingham upon their return. And so you see this newfound momentum in the late 40s with the civil rights movement. As veterans return home, you see the NAACP roles of membership increase dramatically. You see new leaders emerge like Thurgood Marshall who are ready to fight new battles uh, this time in places like classrooms uh, to, to fight for civil rights. And so you see all of this momentum and all of this new action taking place in the civil rights movement. And indeed, Eisenhower's actions, uh, unbeknownst to him at the time and, and largely ignored by history, also had a profound effect. Uh, there was a, an, an assistant at the War Department named Truman K. Gibson, who at the end of the war went in and studied Eisenhower's use of African American troops. And he issued a report that essentially said that, that this use of troops had worked and it made perfect sense. This then led later on uh, to the Gillum Report, later on in the 1940s, which also decided that the use of segregated units didn't really make sense. And that led to the famous Charles Wilson Commission, uh, which produced the To Secure These Rights uh, report that we've all heard of, which of course produces Harry Truman's Executive Order 9981, uh, which comes out in July of 1948. My book, for the first time, predates Truman with Eisenhower. Uh, it shows the direct lineage of the Truman executive order, uh, and it goes all the way back to the Battle of the Bulge and Eisenhower. And so, as the war comes to, the end, to an end, and, and the 1940s, the late 1940s began, the civil rights movement is on the rise, Dwight Eisenhower's career is on the rise. Uh, he is destined for national prominence. He is arguably the most famous man in the world, the most respected man in the world, uh, the most beloved American in the world. And it is almost inevitable at some point uh, that politics will come and pursue him. So the stage is set as we enter the 1950s for this great man to enter office, the White House, and for this great movement uh, to move forward uh, and fight new battles in, in desegregating schools. So, as president, Eisenhower comes along 
And this is our second question, what was he trying to achieve on civil rights? And again, a lot of this is based on his military experience, where he saw as a practical matter that segregation is actually counterproductive, because it, it doesn't make sense not to use all your troops at the front. So Eisenhower approaches civil rights realizing it's a very divisive political issue, realizing it divides the country. He approaches it with, with a couple of very uh, simple uh, pieces of, of strategy, which all sort of tie together. And I want to spend a couple of moments on each one of these, because I think this helps in some ways explain why he's often overlooked uh, on, on civil rights. First, Eisenhower approaches the issue believing there are limits to federal power. And here is the dilemma that he faces, the political dilemma he faces in 1953. How do you promote minority rights in a country governed by majority rule? And that is a profound political dilemma. As someone who spent about 10 years in politics, including at a White House, uh, that is an equation that will scare anybody in a White House. Uh, when you've got a divided country and you're on the other side of the issue, how do you go about changing minds? How do you go about securing enough votes to get things done? That's a very uh, profound challenge that he faced, and in some ways explains why he took the limited step-by-step -step approach that he did. And I'll talk more about that in a second. Secondly, Eisenhower believes, and I hinted at this earlier with my joke, that there are limits to the rhetorical presidency. Now, since Woodrow Wilson gave uh, the State of the Union in person, and since the advent of the fireside chats and, and FDR, uh, the rhetorical role of the presidency had really grown. And Eisenhower, in many ways, is a throwback uh, to an era before that, where a, a president, uh, like a general, uh, works behind the scenes. He's a manager. He's an administrator. He makes decisions. He takes care of business. Uh, but the, the, the rhetorical side of it, the bully pulpit side of it, uh, was something that wasn't entirely comfortable to him, and frankly wasn't something that he thought was terribly effective, as I mentioned earlier. And particularly on an issue that was divisive like civil rights, uh, and I show in the book some of the polling uh, of the 1950s, it was a very divided country on the issue, Eisenhower wasn't sure how much speech making would really do to change minds. And so when Dr. King, for example, ask him to come south and convene a summit where he speaks about this issue, Eisenhower turns him down. This is exactly what Eisenhower didn't want to do. This was not the strategy he was pursuing on civil rights. He wanted to work behind the scenes, not in front of the cameras. And as he often said to his staff, and one of his favorite phrases he often used with them, he didn't want to inflame passions in the south. Third, and this may come as a surprise to many of you, um, but Eisenhower, in many ways, was a conservative. We tend to think of Eisenhower as a moderate. Eisenhower himself often talked about uh, being a moderate. And when I, I use the term conservative, I mean it in a classical sense, meaning uh, he very much favored an evolution to a revolution. He very much favored incremental progress to dramatic change overnight. He believed uh, that there was evil in this world, uh, and that the best way to address it and to change it was step by step and incrementally, uh, which is the, the classic conservative approach uh, to societal change. No less a source, by the way, than Dr. King recognized this after he met with Ike uh, in 1958 to talk about this issue. He pronounced Eisenhower uh, years later in, in recollecting that meeting, he pronounced him as being very sincere on the issue of race. Uh, however, he, he, he talked about Eisenhower having a different approach than King himself did. He said that Eisenhower felt, and these are King's words, uh, that a surgeon's knife was an instrument too radical to touch this best of all societies. It's a perfect metaphor for describing Eisenhower's philosophy. He wanted to create civil rights. He wanted to create change, but he didn't want to do it too dramatically and too quickly, whereas King and many of the civil rights leaders were wanting him to go faster and, and do more. Uh, and again, that's the conservative liberal argument that, that we, we've had in this country since the founding. Fourth, and I think maybe most importantly, Eisenhower, like all great leaders, not only saw where things were in his day, but saw where things were coming in the days and years ahead. Eisenhower, almost from the beginning, and almost alone among other political leaders of his time, had a sense, had a premonition, that a Little Rock-style crisis was coming. Listen to what Eisenhower wrote in his diary, July 24, 1953. I believe that federal law imposed upon our states 
in such a way as to bring about a conflict of the police powers of the states and of the nation would set back the cause of progress in race relations for a long, long time. So Eisenhower, four years before Little Rock, is almost predicting Little Rock. And he's trying to avoid Little Rock by taking his step-by-step -step incremental progress uh, approach rather than trying to, to, to do everything at once and to do it quickly. Uh, he still gets Little Rock, and I'll talk about that, that here in a second. And he's decisive once Little Rock happens. But I think it's a credit to his leadership that he was looking down the road, feeling the pulse of the country, sensing how explosive uh, the tensions were in the South, and trying at all cost to avoid an ugly confrontation between the federal and the state governments. I think any president would try to do the same thing if he had a premonition uh, that something like this was coming. And Eisenhower did from the very beginning and worked very hard to avoid it, as it turns out, unsuccessfully. Now, I mentioned that from the very beginning of his administration, he pursues an incremental approach. What are some examples of that? Well, first of all, he starts where he has authority. He starts as president with the military. Uh, the, the Army in particular had essentially uh, dragged its heels since the Executive Order 9981 of Truman. And so by 1953, it's still a fairly segregated army. By the end of 1953, it's not anymore. Eisenhower has put all of his five-star aura uh, into desegregating it, and he even spends quite a bit of time working on the Navy, which was also a very segregated institution, uh, and gives explicit orders, uh, which I re report, I think, for the first time in my book, uh, his conversations with Secretary Robert Anderson, uh, a Texan, by the way, a Southerner, and essentially orders Anderson to get about the business of desegregating Southern Navy bases, and they do. Within the year, they're essentially desegregated. He also has authority at that time uh, over the District of Columbia. And so he begins working there to desegregate the District of Columbia, sort of like Lincoln uh, early in his career saw D.C. as uh, sort of a showpiece uh, and, and, and wanted to uh, make D.C. essentially a slave-free zone. Eisenhower, 100 years later, sees D.C. very similar as, as the capital of the country. It's a place people look to when they think of America, so why not uh, have a, a segregation-free city? Um, it, it, and it's extraordinary some of the things that he does. He even uh, worries about movie theaters. Uh, and he calls in Hollywood executives to the White House, people like Spiro Skouris of 20th Century Fox and Barney Balaban of Paramount, and he essentially peer pressures them to do the right thing, and, and I know it's a private movie theater, and I, and I know it's a private institution, but do the right thing and desegregate your theaters. And they do. Who can resist Eisenhower? He also, under the advice and counsel of Herbert Brownell, his, his attorney general, begins appointing fair-minded Republican judges throughout the South, and these are the judges who in later years, particularly in the 1960s, will render some of the most important court victories for the civil rights movement. Andrew Young has said that uh, when he and Dr. King were court shopping in the 1960s and trying to find a court uh, that would give them a favorable ruling, they wanted to avoid a Kennedy judge and they wanted to find an Eisenhower judge because the Kennedy judge was a Southern Democrat and the Eisenhower judge was a fair-minded, progressive Republican. And finally, Eisenhower appointed uh, the first African-American to a president's executive staff, Fred Morrow, who I trace uh, quite a bit of Fred Morrow's journey in my book as well. He becomes sort of an important character witness uh, at the White House, uh, uh, confronting Eisenhower, having conversations with Eisenhower about race, and showing Eisenhower's own evolution. Um, so Eisenhower, for the first couple of years, makes some pretty important steps, but they are steps. They're incremental approaches. The Brown versus the Board of Education ruling changes everything because it is nothing if not a revolution and Eisenhower and the entire country have to pick up the pace and he does. Uh, the day after the ruling he calls in uh, the commissioner of the DC schools and tells him to lead the way and implement the Brown ruling in DC. Uh, he files a brief in the what becomes known as the Brown 2 case uh, outlining how southern school districts should go about uh, desegregating their schools. And by the way, he also filed a brief in the first Brown ruling, in the first Brown case, siding with Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP side of the case. Uh, he pushes for the first major civil rights legislation since Reconstruction. Uh, it is finally passed and signed in 1957. But most dramatically and probably most importantly, he enforces the Brown ruling. He gives it life. He gives it legal authority at Little Rock. 
And I spend a good deal of the book dealing with Little Rock because in many ways it is a climax of Eisenhower's journey with race. Indeed, it's a climax of the country's journey with race. Uh, because here is the great test case study of whether or not uh, the Brown ruling is going to work. I mean, if Governor Faubus is able to essentially defy the orders of the court by using uh, law and order as his basis, that it's not that I disagree with the ruling, it's that there's mobs out in front of the school and we have to restore order. If he'd been able to get away with that, uh, he would have established a template that, that other governors likely would have used. Um, and so it becomes a very important moment in the civil rights movement. I think it, it, it may well be the most important move, moment, certainly in school uh, desegregation, uh, because rather than establishing a template for how to defy the federal government, because of Eisenhower's actions, uh, in many ways it establishes a template uh, for how the federal government will in fact uh, desegregate schools. In fact, five years later, uh, when Senator Kennedy, fa or, or President Kennedy by that time, faces a similar crisis at Ole Miss. Uh, he has his aides draw up an executive order sending in National Guard troops, sending in troops, federal troops, and Kennedy specifically says to his aide, is this pretty much what Eisenhower signed in 57? And his aide assures him that he is, and Kennedy signs it. So Kennedy saw, as everyone saw in retrospect, that Eisenhower's actions in 57 were strong and decisive and effective. Let me mention just a couple of things about Eisenhower's leadership at Little Rock because, again, this has been largely misunderstood in history. Um, first of all, Eisenhower was indeed very patient. Uh, no president relishes the opportunity of sending in troops to an American city. It is a last resort for any president. It was a last resort for Eisenhower. Um, but nevertheless, he was entirely engaged on the issue from the beginning. Uh, some of the conventional wisdom has said that Eisenhower uh, it was sort of surprised by Little Rock. I already mentioned to you earlier his diary entry from four years before. Uh, I show in the book his correspondence with Faubus almost from the beginning of the crisis. Uh, he was the least surprised man in America at Little Rock. Uh, he, he had anticipated it. He had feared it. Uh, and when it happened, he was not in denial at all. He knew exactly what was going on. He knew exactly what the stakes were. Uh, and it's also interesting, and again, counter to conventional wisdom, how clear Eisenhower was in his intentions with Faubus. Uh, in the very first correspondence he had with Faubus, Faubus had asked for a meeting, and uh, perhaps hoping that Eisenhower would be sympathetic to him and, and might help him find a way to kind of weasel out of this crisis now that the TV cameras were showing uh, the Arkansas National Guard troops kicking the nine African-American kids out. It was pretty ugly imagery. Uh, Faubus was very popular in Arkansas for it, but was despised everywhere else. So he writes to Eisenhower and requests a meeting, and Eisenhower writes him back, and he essentially says that he's happy to meet with him, but, but there are only two conditions that he'll meet with him on. And, and, and first, he said the first one is, Faubus has to understand that the only purpose of a meeting is to decide how best to enforce the orders of the court. In other words, the only purpose of the meeting is to decide how for you to stop disobeying the law and let the nine African-American kids in school. The very first thing Eisenhower said to him. And the second thing he says to him is he makes a, a none too thinly veiled threat, or at least a reminder to him that, oh, by the way, those Arkansas National Guard troops you're using to block the nine kids from entering the school actually belong to the federal government, and they can be taken away from you. And, of course, that's exactly what Eisenhower does uh, on September 24th. But he still let it play out. He tried everything he could short of using force to find a solution. He worked through a, a, an intermediary, Congressman Brooks Hayes of Little Rock, to try to talk some sense into the governor. He did, in fact, meet with the governor in person, and to the day he died, thought he had a deal with Faubus. He thought Faubus had agreed to go back and do the right thing and let the kids in. Of course, Faubus did nothing of the sort. And when all else had failed, he finally decided uh, to not only federalize the National Guard, but on his own instinct, uh, ordered that regular Army troops be sent in as well, the 101st Airborne. Uh, was sent in the uh, same group that uh, uh, you may remember the, the picture of him the night before D-Day visiting with uh, 101st Airborne troops. Very prestigious unit, and they play a very prominent role uh, in Eisenhower's life, both in World War II and then here again at Little Rock, one of the great ironies of, uh, of history. Uh, within a few weeks, within a few days, the crowd has dispersed, the kids are back in school. Within a few weeks, Eisenhower's withdrawing troops. The crisis subsides. Uh, Sputnik happens in October, and, and the crisis sort of recedes from the front pages. 
uh, but its impact is, is everlasting. Its impact, as I mentioned, goes into the Kennedy administration uh, and, and, and even today. And as I argue in the book, it's hard to, under, it's hard to imagine uh, how other Southern governors wouldn't have tried the same tactics if they had worked. And the only reason they didn't work is because Eisenhower uh, really broke Favis's back. I mean, he overpowered him uh, with force after he tried to let him resolve it himself and, uh, and sent in troops and the, cr and the crisis was resolved. Uh, in later years, Eisenhower, post-presidency, becomes even more progressive on the issue. He becomes even more convinced that America must deal uh, with this great birth defect. Um, he works behind the scenes with President Kennedy on civil rights legislation. <coughs> found letters I don't think have ever been reported on before, uh, going back and forth between Kennedy and, and Eisenhower, talking about how to get Republican votes for civil rights legislation. He is uh, furious with Senator Goldwater in 64 when he opposes the 1964 Civil Rights Act. He confronts him in person about it and chastises him for it. And he even tells his friend Governor Bill Scranton, and this is the first time Bill Scranton has ever told any researcher this. He's still alive, and I interviewed him, and he told me this for the first time. He said that Eisenhower called him after Goldwater had voted against the 64 Civil Rights Act and said he feared the Republican Party would become a, quote, white supremacist party. Very much feared the direction Goldwater was taking the party. He feared it would turn its back on the Lincoln tradition. And frankly, what I think he uh, probably saw is, is, is the Eisenhower tradition, of a, a pro-civil rights approach, a conservative approach, but nevertheless a, a pro-civil rights approach uh, for the party. Um, and we still see some of that conservative <coughs> approach in his writings towards the end. Uh, he does worry about some of the excesses of LBJ and the Great Society. He fears, uh, he says in a letter, uh, the quote-unquote glib assurances of the Great Society, that they assure everybody that racism will disappear and poverty will disappear and everything will be right in the world. And then when those things don't happen, you've raised expectations to such a level that you have disappointment and you have civil unrest. And indeed, we saw in the 60s um, quite a bit of civil unrest uh, in urban areas. So he, he may well have... have have been right about that. Um, so it's a fascinating journey from second lieutenant at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio saying black troops are stupid all the way to chastising Barry Goldwater for opposing the 64 Civil Rights Act and working with John Kennedy uh, to get Republican votes. He comes a long way on the issue and he shows tremendous capacity for growth and for change. Now that leads to our final question um, which is why hasn't anybody given him credit for this before? Um, and I think there's a couple of reasons for this, and this will be our, our, our final point tonight. First of all, Eisenhower is the first reason because he didn't seek a lot of credit. He was an inherently modest man. Uh, he didn't like patting himself on the back. He didn't like touting his own accomplishments. Indeed, when he was writing his memoirs, uh, I found a letter from his editor, Sam Vaughn, at Doubleday, uh, encouraging him to talk more about civil rights. Uh, it was just not something that he... Uh, wanted to send out a press release about and, and tout his own achievements. In today's politics, all politicians do that. Uh, Eisenhower was, was very uncomfortable uh, claiming credit uh, for those things. Uh, the second reason is Eisenhower, I think in many ways, found it difficult to talk about Little Rock. Uh, and this, I think, is, is, is pretty understandable to see why. Eisenhower viewed Little Rock in many ways uh, as a failure and not as a success. If you have to send federal troops into a city to get people to obey the law, that's a bad thing, it's not a good thing. And it's not something you want to tout as one of your great achievements. In fact, Eisenhower, uh, the day after he sent the 101st Airborne into Little Rock, uh, and he gave his famous speech from the Oval Office on September 20th, the night of September 24th, 1957, he flies back to uh, Newport, Rhode Island, where he was staying. He takes a, a friendly reporter with him. They have an off-the-record discussion, which I discovered in the archives in Abilene. And Eisenhower says in that discussion, the day after he sent in the troops, that sending troops into Little Rock was the hardest thing he'd ever had to do except for D-Day, which is a remarkable thing when you think about it. Here's this great man with this tremendous life and all of these accomplishments and all of these challenges, and the two hardest things he said he ever had to do were D-Day and Little Rock. Um, Little Rock was a, a very gut-wrenching moment for him. It was not something he enjoyed doing, although it was not something he shied away from. Uh, but it certainly was not something he wanted to talk about. And, uh, and because he didn't talk about it, others didn't talk about it, and he's gotten very little credit for it. A third reason, and this is 
really fascinating to me as a, as a historian and a researcher. A lot of Eisenhower's friends have given him very little credit on the issue. Now, there is a temptation in talking about Eisenhower and civil rights to focus only on the good. Uh, I had to really struggle with that temptation myself because I admire him greatly and I think he's, he's not gotten the credit he deserves on the issue. But the fact is it was a struggle for him. And the fact is he did have to come a long way on the issue. Uh, it was not something uh, that he was comfortable speaking about publicly, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, he wanted to take a slower approach. He wanted to bring the country along. Uh, and frankly, he worried about going too fast and having a counter-reaction. Um, and so what you have is, in the oral histories and the memoirs that were written by people who were with him at the time, you have people all sort of saying the same thing about him on civil rights. People like Ann Whitman, his secretary, Stephen Benedict, Art Larson, Jim Haggerty, his press secretary, uh, Sweet Hazlitt, one of his best friends, C.D. Jackson, Fred Morrow, his African-American aide that I mentioned earlier, Max Rabb, Bill Scranton, Herbert Brownell, they all say remarkably similar things about Eisenhower and race. And basically what they all say is that, I think Brownell put it best, his heart was in the right place, but he didn't really want to lead a crusade on the issue. And so, rather than disregard all of that evidence, <clears throat> All of these contemporary sources who were with Eisenhower, I don't ignore them, I include them in my account. And I don't argue that their accounts are inaccurate. I simply argue that their accounts are incomplete. They were with Eisenhower at a moment in time, maybe a couple of years, maybe a little bit longer, but they were with him for a period of his journey, not the whole journey. And so when these people say that they saw him uh, for example, Ann Whitman saying that she had these conversations with him in the Oval Office and he talked about how difficult this issue was and, and he had friends in the South who, who were upset. I don't doubt that those conversations took place, but Ann Whitman wasn't with him in the 60s when he's meeting with John Kennedy talking about how to get Republican votes for civil rights. And so, so her account doesn't reflect his growth over the years because <clears throat> she was with him for a period of time. And so so often historians have gone back and quoted from these memoirs and quoted from these oral histories and said, well, see, these people who worked for Eisenhower said that he didn't really do a lot on the issue. But what they don't do is they don't factor in the entire journey, the entire, uh, not just eight years of his presidency, but the eight years uh, of his ex-presidency, the, the growth during World War II. I mean, this is a tremendous story of him evolving over time. And I, I think my book, in many ways, is the first to tell the whole story from start to finish and include along the way some of these negative accounts that people have, but also show him really getting it right in the end. And so I think in the end what I've created in this book um, is a pretty balanced picture that on the whole shows a great man dealing with a great issue moving in the right direction and eventually getting it right and making a profound difference on the issue along the way. Um, to me, history is dynamic. It's not static. And so what I've created, I hope, is a directional biography. Uh, it shows Eisenhower moving in the right direction. And if there's one story that I think sort of captures the narrative that I tried to create, it comes from Fred Morrow, his African-American aide, who confronted Eisenhower once and said, uh, about some testimony he had given as an army officer, sort of denigrating black troops. And Fred Morrow confronts him and says, why did you say that? And Eisenhower looks at him for a long time and says, isn't your father a minister? And Fred Morrow says, well, yes, he is. And Eisenhower says, well, then you know about forgiveness. And that's where I'm living now. And in this way, Eisenhower's struggle with race not only mirrors the country's struggle, but it mirrors our own. Because all of us, in some way, struggle somewhere. And the story of our lives is the story of redemption. It's the story of change. It's the story of growth, of growing and getting better and righting the wrongs in our lives. And so Eisenhower on civil rights uh, is not a saint, uh, but he certainly makes a, a, a great uh, progress on the issue and makes a great difference in his own life and his own thinking on the issue. Let me close with a quick comment about leadership, because Eisenhower shows his great leadership on this very difficult issue, and I think his leadership speaks to us today. We learn from Eisenhower that leaders don't just do things right, 
they do the right thing. And the right thing, though often simple, is almost never easy. We learn that any politician can make a statement, but only a leader can make a difference. And a difference comes, a real difference, through actions, not words, over time, not overnight. We learn that in the stormy seas of life, steady must be the hand at the helm, calm the mind and confident the demeanor, for the crew and sometimes even nature itself will respond to the captain at the helm. And we learn that the powerful chemistry of leadership is composed of the twin elements of courage and conviction. Courage makes conviction possible, and conviction gives courage its meaning. So, to return to the question I began with, why did I do Eisenhower? Because Eisenhower has something to say to us today about leadership, about courage, about a steady hand in difficult times, about dealing with difficult challenges that don't have obvious, easy solutions. There's a lot we can learn from Eisenhower in our own day and our own challenges. Here is a great man wrestling with a great challenge and making a great difference in the end. I'm honored to tell this story. I hope I did it justice. And at this time, I'll be glad to take your questions.